What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to Unhinged Talk. As usual, I'm your host, Patrick Hennessy. Today, I'm joined by Paris Kivazinofantos, Vin Bonacorso, and our special guest for today, Double A utility man, third base, shortstop, wherever he wants to play, Max Bird. How are you guys doing today? What's up, guys? Yourself? Oh. Can't complain, you know, quarantine life, just the usual, you know. But, um,. I'm glad we have Max joining us today. Um, definitely going to be glad to be here. Definitely going to be some fun. We got a lot to talk about, so um, I say we just get right into it. So, uh, Max, tell us a little about like where you grew up, uh, where you went to school, uh, who's your favorite player, just a little bit about yourself before entering the Yankees organization. Yeah, so I grew up uh, in a town called North Andover, which is like 45 minutes north of Boston. Um, you know, grew up, grew up playing a bunch of different sports. I'm an, I'm an only child. So I played, you know, you know, my dad kind of got me into everything growing up, whether it was football, golf, basketball, baseball, everything. So, um, you know, have kind of sports in my blood. He's just, he's actually a sports editor in a newspaper, um, in the New England area. So okay. just been around all, all games. So I knew kind of sports was going to be my, uh, track from a young age. So. Grew up, and then I went to uh, St. John's Prep in Danvers, like an all an all boys prep school, and then from there I went to Northeastern University, uh, where I played four years there of baseball, and then luckily ended up getting drafted by the wonderful, beloved New York Yankees. Um, so yeah, no, it was a great, it was it was a great day that day. I got drafted, and um, you know the 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 position I'm in right now is is um, one I'm very grateful for. So I'm pumped to be a New York Yankee and hopefully wear these pinstripes for the next 15, 20 years. So tell me, what was like the reaction from your friends and family being from Boston drafted by the New York Yankees? Yeah, well, my my draft day was a crazy day. You know, it was um, (laughs) – Because you know, I heard I heard late teens, early twenties from you know talking to my agent and all that kind of stuff, and because mm. obviously I was going to be a senior sign. So, um, and then just so like round eighteen's done, round twenty's done, no pick. So then I just left my house. I was like, I'm done with this. I'm done. I'm leaving. So I went for like a walk around my the, the like development where I'm from. Um, kind of so I so one of my buddies who I'm very close with. Mickey Gasper, who who's actually I'm quarantined with right now here in Texas, um, he was picked in the 27th round, and he, or I text him, I'm like, let's go, like that's awesome. I said, did Matt Hyde, who's our area scout, he's like, did did he text you before or something? He's like, no, I found out, or he called me like five minutes after I got picked, so I, I was just following the draft tracker and he got picked. So then I was walking home and my grandfather ended up, my grandfather passed away at the beginning at the beginning of that year and he was always a huge fan of mine and I just remember walking down the street I'm like Papa right here let's go we need this and then boom like five seconds after that just name popped up Max Burt New York Yankees so it was a pretty surreal day and I could hear my parents screaming from the you know other end of the street so and then that turned to a little fun night and then like five days later I was on a flight to Tampa so that's pretty crazy. crazy day and yeah, but it was awesome. I could only imagine. Yeah, but that was, um, that was probably exhilarating to have that, you know, that vibe that your grandpa led you to that, you know? No, I know it's true. It's it was uh it was pretty cool. And I've told that story to a bunch of people. There's been some tears, but it was um it was really cool. It it was a really special day, so um but yeah, I mean you're you're on a high for that for that night and then you're back to business. So it's um it's a, it's a grind from there. So. so I'm curious about this, to be honest with you. Um, in college, what, what was your primary position? So I played shortstop. Like the first 15 okay. games of my career, I played second base. And then mm-hmm. for the rest, I played shortstop. So now what's the transition like from being like a primary shortstop, like knowing what position you're going to play every day, to now being kind of like a utility guy sometimes – being at third or short, or I know you mentioned sometimes first or second. Yeah. What's the mentality that changes in your game that way? So, I mean, I think, you know, growing up playing shortstop, 
I, I think like if you're if you can play shortstop, you can play basically all the all the positions across the infield. So, I mean, I don't really see it as a huge adjustment. Um, you know, at the at the end of the day, you see the ball, you catch the ball, and you throw it across the diamond. But um, you know, really, it starts with shortstop. If you can play shortstop, you can kind of play all across the infield. So, it's not so much me like kind of thinking about all right, where am I going to play today? Like, where am I going to play the next day? It's just kind of me, me going to the field. I know I can play defense at a high level, so I'm just going to go out there and play. So I don't really think about much much as far as, you know, or I hope I'm playing short today or hope I'm playing third. It's just yeah. where they put me, I, I want to be in the lineup and hopefully have some have some success. Yeah. So I feel like, um, I feel like as a shortstop, you could play anywhere on the field because I feel like almost yeah. as a shortstop, you see players like Trey Turner, who is almost transitioning mm-hmm. to a center fielder. And then you have, you know, just like, I feel like although DJ LeMahieu isn't a shortstop by trade as a middle infielder, you put DJ LeMahieu in left field, he's playing it. You you know, it's like, yeah. Those middle infielders, I mean, I like to argue because I played center field that center fielders, mm-hmm. you know, can play anywhere, but that's just not true because infield is a whole different ball game. And, uh, the middle yeah. infield are definitely, you know, the co-chiefs of the field, I would say. And they could, I mean, like, like, I mean, as you're doing now, play the super utility man part of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I think, and I think now today's game, like that ability to play all, all those positions across the field is definitely going to help me down the road. So honestly, you know, in pro ball, if you're DHing, if you're playing first, you just want to be in the, line up any 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 way you can so you don't really you really think about where they're going to put you if, if they put you in left center right first second so um you just want to be able to play you know that's the best way to move up so growing up and throughout college has anybody given you advice that you've taken and you still keep with you even at the major level yeah it's actually a very good question um so me obviously coming from small school like my junior year of high school I, I played half the games at shortstop because we had a stacked team and I played half the games at short and I got dh for so I didn't even hit I just played defense at short yeah. and then my senior year finally got to play in the varsity for my first time like a full out full-fledged playing and then you know crazy story I'll go into it quickly but I, I wasn't going to go to school after my senior year I was going to do a post-grad year at either Phillips Exit or Phillips Andover two like top prep schools and I met with them. They're like, yeah, you can come in, play baseball, basketball. And so I was like, all right, great. So I applied to those two schools and I got waitlisted on both of them. So I had no idea where I was going when I crossed graduation my senior year. And um, I ended up just meeting with Glav, talking to Glav. And, um, you know, he just said, hey, this is a chance for you to play right away. And we really want you to come next year. We don't have any scholarship money, but something might open up at the draft and everything. So, um yeah, no, it ended up just working out. I got in the car after that meeting. I'm like, Dad, I'm going there. I'm, go- I'm going Northeastern next year. I'm doing it. So, uh, yeah, no, it was um, – so, like, I've always kind of been on, like, the bottom end of everybody's radar. And, you know, I've always kind of used that as fuel. Um, you know, even at the – you know, even at the college level, you know, my junior year, I heard I was going to draft it. No one takes a shot at me. And then senior year, I kind of fall late in the draft. So, it's just, like, all these things are adding up and – um you know, I just kind of use that as fuel, but something that someone said to me, just, I don't remember exactly who it was, but just get better every day, win the day. And, um, you know, especially professional baseball, you can't really think so much of, you know, big picture, like, well, you, well, you got to think about big picture, but, um, you can't be thinking about tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow. You got to kind of live in the moment and just worry about the day. So winning that day, you know, being the best that can possibly be that day is kind of something I've always stay with and has kind of been with me in professional baseball as well. So branching off of Paris Gives's question on like on that coming through the ranks of, you know, the minor leagues, I'm sure is a grind, you know, you always hear the stories and, you know, the good and the bad, but has there been any higher up talent or higher up scout, maybe a coach that's given you firsthand advice on where you would, you know, what you should like, how you should go about things? Like, you know, take a lot of reps and practice here because, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so some along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, me as a player, I've 
I've always kind of been a, de- a defensive first guy. Like my whole life, I've always been a good defender. And, um, you know, I think, I think the best thing that I've learned here in pro ball, you know, and I'll just kind of go off the hitting side, but it's been like making, making practice as, as hard as possible. So then when you get in the game, everything kind of slows down for you. So, yeah, yeah, you know, so like if like we're going to cage, like it's not just like hit off a tee, hit flips. Like we don't even do that. We literally don't hit flips or tee anymore. It's right to either a side toss or, you know, short BP batting practice or machine work. So it's kind of like, speeding up making that practice harder so then when you get in the box for that game it kind of slows everything down so you'll see a lot of failure at practice and you'll get frustrated but you got to stay with it you can't you can't kind of go back to basics where you know when we were kids growing up it'd be like all right we take 10 swings off the tee hit the back yeah, yeah. net and feel great you know so it's kind of making that practice hard and um you know having everything slow down for in the in the game so I think that's superb advice, actually, for, you know, especially kids that are going to watch. And and realistically, most kids are not pro baseball prospects. So to show them that, like, to make their practice a little more intense, you know, that could definitely lead to creating a culture amongst themselves that, you know, pushes them to be better, as as you've done. And like you said, you were the underdog, and now you're playing in the Yankees organization. So that seems like a pretty good underdog story that you're living so far, so – yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I want to say that let's transition into like a little more of a comical moment. Um, last season, I know that there's video of Max when he was playing third base in Charleston. It looked like a, uh, a pop-up down the uh, third baseline and Max is going to get it. And uh, Max, you want to describe what kind of happened on that play? Yeah. So it was just like a kind of play and, you know, I, I, I kind of think about plays in the field, like, kind of before they happen. And, um, you know, obviously playing third or even if I'm playing first, I'm thinking about balls over my head or I make a diving catch or, and, or something like that. Or, like, the essentially the Jeter play when he caught it and went into the stands that one game. Um, you know, those are plays you think about before they happen. And then if they happen, you know, you're already kind of in that zone per se. So – that's obviously a play I've always think about like over the head at third base, try, trying to make a sick catch. And um, I saw it happen right off the bat. I got a pretty good jump and started running. And I know that was near where the bullpen was of the other team. Cause we have like on the field bullpens out in Charleston. Hmm. And um, I just ran, I was looking at the ball, I was looking up and I ended up just um, smashing into the bullpen catcher and just kind of flip, kind of like flipped <laughs> over him. Huh. Like everyone kind of stopped for a second and like no one knew what the call was. The umps didn't know cause nothing happened, but ended up the kid, the, the kid, um, it was just a routine foul ball that they didn't call it out or anything off when I think personally, I probably, I probably would have caught it. So that, that probably should have huh. been interference to be honest. Yeah. Our, our coach came out to argue that, but because like he didn't know where the catcher wasn't like looking at the field, they couldn't call it. And because it was kind of like a little bit further than like if I was camped under it, they couldn't oh. they couldn't call it so i mean but i would think that's like his duty to get away from that ball kind of like the yeah, ball I mean, boy I'm surprised have to... that i kind of got up and looked at the pitchers that were standing right there i'm like you guys couldn't say anything or yeah anything else, i so. mean especially because that could have hurt the you know their own bullpen catcher just as bad as it could hurt yeah you know, yeah you know, that's true and that's true a knee from a big dude running full speed is not gonna feel good <laughs> just like just like flipping over on the ground ain't gonna feel good so i mean right yeah. to the back yeah that is kind of a, not the uh, not a cool thing to do from that uh, pitching staff. I guess that will remain unnamed. <laughs> I know. So last year when that play happened in Charleston, did you go directly to Trenton after that, or were there other stops in between? So I broke camp in Charleston, um, and then so basically after my whole timeline went from Charleston to Tampa. Uh, to extended spring training for one day, back to Charleston for like two months, and then I finished the year in um, in Trenton. So, long story short, kind of you know broke camp with Charleston. Um, had a pretty good had pretty good spring training last year, so I was feeling good coming out, ready to go. And they kind of got off to a sluggish start, and um, kind of was pressing early and. You know, obviously, in a 140 game season, I've never, I've never played that. It's always been a 56 game college season. So, um, started pressing way too early, and I was thinking way too much, changing things in my swing. And you know, I was struggling. I got called in the office, and the manager's like, "Hey, you're going up to Tampa." 
And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. So I went up to the um, Tampa Tarpons and, you know, played pretty well my first, my first couple of games. And then again, kind of same thing, kind of fell back into my defensive swing and, you know, nothing was clicking. I was playing really good defense, but nothing was clicking at the plate. And the manager called me and she said, Hey, they're sending you back to extended spring training, work on some things and hopefully see you soon. So I ended up just going to extended and, um, you know, wanted to work on my swing cause I was changing things up and everyone, I, I was hearing so many different things from different people. So, um, you know, I kind of just went back to the basics and, um, you know, it just kind of worked out where, um, one day Troy, Troy Tulowitzki was hitting in a cage and he needed some guy obviously to give him a little breather. So we're, we were hitting in, the, in that cage batting practice for 30, 40 minutes. And wow. he wasn't really saying much throughout the whole time, but at the end just kind of told me one thing about my posture, about kind of being upright and being in that strong base. And, you know, the, the way he said it just kind of clicked for me. And, um, yeah, it was, it turned out to be, you know, like them sending me back to extended kind of a wake up call, but more like that's going to be very good for me in the long run because, that's you know, awesome, I figured yeah. I obviously hit with this living legend and figured out some things. And then after, you know, I played in one game and extended, hit a home run and then a single. And then that night they called me and said, hey, all right, you're going back to Charleston. And I awesome. went on like a tear for like three, four weeks there. Right, right when I got back, I hit, I think I hit like six homers in three weeks and, um, and then kind of cooled down back down a little bit. And then obviously at the top, we know all the injuries that were happening. So some spots opened up and um, obviously you don't want anybody getting hurt, but my name was called to go to Trenton and, you know, I kind of took advantage of that opportunity. So you can't really, uh, you know, you, you know, when your name's called in pro ball, you just kind of answer the phone and you go. So you don't really ask any uh, questions. So, yeah, that's incredible. Um, so once you get to Trenton, there is um there's a piece of the Trenton Thunder that everybody loves. And that's Rookie the Bat Dog. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to give us a little bit of insight as to what rookie's like behind the scenes? So I've always seen pictures, but I never really put it together. Like I didn't I didn't knew Tre- I, I I knew there was a dog bat boy, but I didn't really put everything <laughs> together. I didn't really picture like Huh. Trent Thunder, I, I never saw that on his bib or, or, or anything. So <laughs> when I got there the first game, I was like, oh, okay, so this is where the dog's the bat boy. And I didn't know how, like, it works, obviously, because I've never, <laughs> you know, been in that situation. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was – it's it's awesome. It gets the fans involved. Uh, there was a couple funny instances where, you know, a kid would hit a foul ball and would drop his bat. And then rookie would like run and get the bat and, and the kid would like have his bat in his hand, like holding it up and rookie would be like jumping on him, trying to get the bat because he didn't That's know what was going on. I would love um, that. I would just play with a dog the whole time. Like, oh, no, I know. Seriously. Hey, you got to watch her. yourself because uh, you know, go, going up to hit, you want to pet the dog, but you got to get locked in for this 95, yeah. mi- 95 mile an hour cutter you're about to see. So. Yeah. yeah. I would love to see rookie in the Bronx one day, but like, I doubt it would happen, but that would be the, biggest attraction to go see the Yankees seriously I wouldn't be surprised if that if that happened for sure yeah because he's making his way up the ranks right wasn't he originally in Tampa I believe I think he's been all over he stopped I think the family that has him is like always been in Trenton but he's mm-hmm. been to all the affiliates just because yeah. he it technically is like a Yankee dog per se yeah so. yeah um so you're telling me so you're telling me the rookie didn't big league you he didn't like walk by and like you know like <laughs> No, he didn't big league me. He didn't big league me. He actually gave me some time, maybe licked my hand a couple times. So he didn't big league me for sure. But you probably paid him in chin rub, so it works out nice, right? Exactly, exactly. (laughs) That's good. Um, So with the whole pandemic that's sweeping across the entire world, everyone's in quarantine, basically. As you can see, I'm in my car right now. Yeah, he's taking (laughs) taking refuge in his car. In weeks. No. (laughs) I've been in my car for three straight weeks. (laughs) Um, so it's no surprise that, uh, the Yankees minor league had two cases and that Mm -hmm. left, uh, many of you guys having to self isolate for two weeks. Uh, what was that like? Bring us through like that experience. Yeah, that was interesting. I mean, we had to, um, you know, so we were at the field one day and, um, we were going through a normal day. I think it was a Friday and because we heard like on Thursday, everybody was, everybody was leaving on Friday or Saturday across all baseball. 
but we had a meeting on Thursday said, Hey, we're going to have a normal day Friday. Um, and then we're just going to kind of play it by ear from there. So we had a normal day, uh, you know, stretched, uh, played catch, took ground balls, went into the cages, go hit. And I was going back to run out to, um, you know, hit batting practice in the field. And then everyone's like, Hey, we have a meeting on field four Cashman's here. So when, so when you hear that you sprint and you go to the field, wherever he's at. So, um, he basically just had a meeting kind of, you know, telling us because he was on a conference call with major league baseball and the players association, and they were going to shut it down for the day and kind of play it by ear, you know, take the weekend off and then kind of reevaluate on Sunday. And so we had a conference call. So we kind of just chilled after that Friday, chilled Saturday, chilled Sunday, didn't really do much. And then um, on Sunday, we had a conference call with uh, Cashman and Kevin Reese, our player development, and basically all across uh, all the players in the minor leagues and um, – or no, in the Yankees minor league system. And he basically said that we have, we have one case of corona in our system and uh, unfortunately, because we had a doctor on the call too, kind of going through all the symptoms and stuff like that. And he said, unfortunately, you guys have to be here for the next like 10, 10 to 12 days in quarantine because you could have been, um, you know, around this virus or got infected by this person um, because he was in the locker room that Thursday and times leading up. And obviously with this virus, you can not show symptoms, you know, until 10 days yeah. after you actually get it. So. Um, you know, we kind of made fun of the whole situation. We, you know, tried to have some fun. I don't know if you saw my Instagram videos joking around in the yard by, by our Airbnb, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it sucked, but you know, everybody technically is in this, so you, you can't really complain. You just kind of, kind of get any positive light you can out of it. So, yeah. Have you heard anything about whether the season's going to start around July? Or yeah, so we actually haven't heard much. We haven't heard anything that after, um, you know, when we were packing our stuff to go, they were just saying, unfortunately, you guys got to pack to be, to be home for longer than expected. Um, obviously, no one across baseball, fans don't want this, players don't want this, player development doesn't want this, but you, you kind of got to put your health first because it's, you know, not going to oh, really, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you can get it with kids our age, but it's really about affecting other people, so. Yeah. You kind of got to quarantine yourself and be smart during this pandemic that we're in. So it yeah. sucks, but I, you got to deal with it. I think that I'm on the, from what I've seen, like seen so far or of social media, I'm a part of the minority of that's optimistic that it'll be better sooner than later. Yeah. I don't mean like mid April sooner, but I think, you know, early June is relative to be fair. I think, you know, I agree. Like, world, but like the, no, I think World Day weekend, I agree. I think, I mean, you know, I'm obviously optimistic. I know all a bunch of the players are too, because, you know, we, we want to play, but, um, sure. you know, I've, I've heard so much stuff. I've seen tweets that, Oh, there's no chance they play. I don't think they're going to play, but you know, you can't really believe anything until anything until it's set in stone. So, um, Man. I think that's yeah. been sickening to me has been the, uh, the media people that have pushed so the, many uh, rumors and fake news. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it's I think it's, uh, the speaking on like speaking on matters that are uninformed or like, or they'll they'll put out a tweet like, oh, we're like you know, word is we won't be able to leave our house, we won't be able to like see our friends and go to a bar till twenty twenty one, and then someone's like, all right, where's your like where's your stats on that? They're like, well, we don't have any. It's just assumption. Yeah. Well, why would you tweet? Why would you tweet that then? Why no, would you no. put that out there for millions of people to see that you know to scare people? And then yeah. it comes back and in June, if we're good, how dumb do you look? Yeah. You know, because it's everything, like, because everything in the news you hear nowadays is all negative. Not one yeah. day do you mm -hmm. hear anything positive. So it, the more, yeah, the cases and deaths are going up, obviously we, it still hasn't reached its peak, but, but so at this right. We have to be optimistic and just pray this thing goes over and everybody's safe, healthy, and mm -hmm. everybody can get on with their normal lives because I know for sure we miss baseball, but Max definitely misses being out on that field on a daily basis. Yeah, no, I think I think obviously this is kind of this is you know sports is obviously a big thing, but you know health and safety of you know people is obviously more important. You know that kind of trumps everything. So, um, you know I think if people kind of take 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 care of themselves and you know do what they're supposed to do and you know are doing what these you know doctors are telling people to do, then I think 
you know, I'm optimistic that hopefully this is done sooner rather than later. But, you know, like I said, you know, we don't really know until, until MLB says, Hey, this is our start date until MLB tweets. It puts out an Instagram, not a yeah, writer or anything. So, yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, obviously this is a big topic to talk about because it's, mm-hmm. you know, we're living it right now, but, um, I think that, uh, I mean, again, small sample size, me and me knowing people who have it or who've beat it and, you know, talking to doctors, reading stuff. The best thing I read so far was a doctor from Cornell is in an epicenter and he's working in the city right now to help people, you mm-hmm. know, the city is the centerpiece of the U S right now, of, as far as like the cases. And he put out this really, really well-written like piece with uh, someone from the Cornell sun. I think it's called, you know, telling people that like you shouldn't be listening to a lot of this mass media with how much they're telling you to be scared when it is fairly easy to avoid. And it's not as easy to contract as they're telling you that, mm-hmm. You know, with the right steps in place, like I'm sure you guys know, you're in the Yankees organization. I'm sure they have you guys taking proper steps yeah. to being healthy. And no, and I to think the right that, place. I think that, I think us staying those extra, you know, two weeks, 10 days was a testament of that. You know, we, you know, the Yankees, you know, do things in the right way or they, they, they do things the, the right way. So it's, um, you know, they were getting advice and, protocols from doctors and people higher up than them and um you know they gave them to us so um i think right there that's kind of what the yankees are all about you know when it comes to doing doing things like that whether it be on the field or even you know like this situation off the field so of course, um, of course. Yeah. yeah i mean it's terrible this is i mean the, the the thing that's so bad about this is you know like no one knows like obviously like when a problem faces like if you face like if you're with your college baseball team and something bad happens you look at the coach because you know they've maybe been involved and it's not the coach and the captain or something like that where this one like no one's ever been involved in this so no one's really at the top in this whole situation because no one knows what's going to happen so that's what we're all kind of just in the dark so we just kind of try to be safe stay keep your distance from people and social distancing yep (laughs) that gray area is like what is craziest to me because like you see two yankees minor leaguers get it which you're living literally and then yep. you see that, like, the WWE is airing WrestleMania right now. How do people who are literally all over each other not have a worry, but baseball players couldn't play in the game? There's so much of a gray area that, yeah, yeah. that I, 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 I can't find it in myself to understand. Because Dana White was going to air Khabib versus Tony Ferguson, like, for the UFC. and Yeah. That is literally as touching and saliva and blood. Yeah, as you so can I be. think that I th- I think that it's be it's not like the actual players. Like I don't think they're worried about MLB players giving it to other yeah, MLB players. Yeah. I think it's you know it's the contracting the fans it. like being that social yeah. gathering of so many people yeah. in the same area. That's what's that that's what they're avoiding. They're not avoiding like honestly, they could probably be airing games of people playing with no fans, but then teams aren't going to make any money at all so then that that wouldn't be worth it for the team to do that so that's the problem right there it's just like the like it's it's gonna be interesting to see when you know when the whole stadium can fill up to watch a yankees game you know rather than you know i wonder if maybe they'll start with just playing with no fans you know we saw that a couple times with the i think i think the white Sox did it maybe last year for a weekend when something was going around so White Sox and Orioles during those protests. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's the right. Baltimore protests. Yeah, it was a couple There's years ago. There's a legend, legendary call from uh, what's his name? Gary Thorne. Thorne, yeah. right? That's his name. Yeah, Orioles. Yeah. Legendary call on Adam Jones's double center field that game. He calls it like like Adam Jones is playing in the Masters. Dude. Oh is, yeah, funny. I remember that. That's I remember funny. that. It was like a golf call. Yeah. But oh, um, dude, he, but like that's what that's why people in media can be good during this because if the MLB chose to do so, chose to put people in stadiums, chose to put baseball players playing in empty stadiums, that's where those personalities could be really, really, like, you know, fun. Yeah. That's where they have a chance to bring in people to the booth. Like, I think like, that, you know. Yeah, I think, I, I, think, I think that's a great point. I think that, I think that too, they will, I think that that too, they, um, they will, like that's going to be involved in baseball. I don't think 
just because this COVID, like that's going to happen. I think, you know, obviously you saw in spring training this year, you'll see guys get mic'd up and stuff like that. Like, well, I don't oh, think they're going to be actually mic'd up throughout like a regular season game or a game that means something. But um, I think baseball is definitely doing a better job with, you know, players being able to express themselves and interact more with fans. And uh, yeah, I think sure. that's just going to get better and better down the years. And, you know, that's what players want to do. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to interact with fans and media like you guys and, you know, express myself and uh, show everybody kind of who I am. And, um, you know, I think these are great platforms and, you know, I think it's just going to get better and better throughout, throughout the years in baseball. Yeah. That's, actually, I was reading, that's a good point. I was, no, go ahead, Pascavis. I was actually reading that due to the pandemic being largely spreading through New York, I was hearing that the Yankees might play in a neutral site maybe a spring training facility. Yeah, I saw that. If the season were to start in July. Or... Yeah. I mean, I did, you know, I I was just, I was actually talking to my buddy who's from New Jersey That's last nice. year and his his brother is actually a doctor. <laughs> um his his brother's a doctor out in New York and kind of was telling him and says like, yeah, like I I can't really picture anything really happening in New York City for a while. So I kind of that, that kind of hit me like, wow, baseball if baseball can't start where would the Yankees play if they if it did start. So I don't know. I, I guess we'll just got to, we, we just got to wait and see with this. We can't really predict anything. I mean, we can talk about it, but nothing's yeah. really going to happen until this whole thing's just so crazy. Season, so. I think never this, expect it. like uh, me and Patrick had a conversation like a couple about how, you know, amongst the craziness and negativity has been somewhat of a blessing in disguise that you have time. You know, how many times do you tell yourself if I had more time, I would do this. If yeah. I had more time, I would finish this. Yeah. Would, whatever. So this is a chance, I think, especially with the MLB and their constant push to be equal with the NFL and NBA, uh, you know, amongst the reality TV aspect of, like, the sport. Like, where if they had to open the season without fans, and I don't care if you had to play 108 games, give me baseball mm-hmm. for one. But two, Mike up. Mike up Aaron Judge. Mike up, yeah. you know, so like how hilarious, how hilarious would it be to listen to DJ LeMahieu? All right, one out. Hey, God, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's no. true. It's true. Like, I think, I think like, you're going to start seeing that. Um, Some guys are going to like that. Some guys aren't. But, um, you know, I always, growing up, I'm assuming you guys did too. Like when, when they would show those, you know, 15 second mic ups of any player in any sport, it would be like the best 15 seconds of the game, yeah. you know, seeing them actually interact with other players, stuff like that. So, I think you're definitely going to start seeing that more and it's going to get more people into the sport of baseball, which is what we need. How funny would it have been if this pandemic was going on in 2017 and there was no fans and all of a sudden you just hear the banging of the trash cans with the ash. I didn't even think of that. (laughs) All you heard was the trash can getting hit. Everybody's like... And then you just hear mic'd up Aaron Judge. Yo, bro, what was that? (laughs) Um, but yeah, I say that's why platforms like this are so crucial for building the game of baseball, because in baseball, it's, it's one of the few sports where the players don't really have much personality attached to them. And that's because of all the barriers set by major league baseball, especially with the limitations of media access, uh, prior to this off season, people couldn't really post MLB highlight videos to YouTube or Twitter without the fear of being copyrighted or mm-hmm. having the video taken down. So I think that it's important for MLB to take this time to kind of like bring themselves into the new age of media and give their players an opportunity to show the world what they're made of. Like if Mike Trout walked into a restaurant, people wouldn't know who he is. And he's yeah. probably the greatest baseball player of our generation. So For something sure. needs to change, and maybe this could be a wake-up call for MLB to be like, look, we need to market our players better. Yeah, oh, it's true. Yeah. But um, since we're on the topic of quarantine, um, I have one final question for you, and it's kind of a fun one. Uh, Let's hear it. So you were locked up in Airbnb, you mentioned, with a bunch of your teammates. Give me your best and worst teammate to be quarantined with. Okay. <laughs> Well, this is going to be funny because my worst is actually someone I'm quarantined with right now. So that's just the best part about this. Oh, man. Um, uh, so I would say the best would have to be either Mickey Gasper or um, 
Dan Bees, who I'm living with right now. They're two of my boys. We kind of came up through the system together. We played in Pulaski right after the draft. You know, our lockers were right, were right next to each other after the draft. And I've known Mickey for years now. Um, so those two would be my one I would definitely want to live with. And then the one I wouldn't would be Josh Bro, And we're staying at his house. Um, <laughs> so Josh will appreciate that if he ever hears this, but um, you can't let Josh watch this. <laughs> no, don't no. tell him. I mean, they're happened. all playing. They're they're definitely all playing Call of Duty right now. So I mean, I'm yeah. absolute trash at that yeah. game. So I'm kind of the outlier here in the house. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Finn loves his Call of Duty. Yeah, I just I just bought a PlayStation to try and get into it, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how I. Uh, you got to we'll get into I the show. It. No, yeah. no, you know what's going to be hilarious? You know it would be really funny if Josh Bro went to watch a video and it's like, unhinged media blocked you. <laughs> Nobody knows <laughs> why. But... <laughs> no, I know. But, um... Oh, God. No, it's awesome, yeah. No, I, I, I honestly like living with all these guys. It's, it's, it's fun. We, we've we've kind of got our work in here in the makeshift weight room here in his garage, so... um. It's been it's been great so far. We're gonna we're gonna keep rolling with the punches and um, go from there. So that's awesome. Um, well, personally, I think that's all I really had to ask you, Vin Para. If you guys have anything left, I have a uh, I have one you know piece of uh, piece of something that I observed. I saw a Patriots hat on uh, my man Max. Hurt. <laughs> yes. So uh, oh, do, you care, man. Do, you, do you care to tell us the background on a uh, on the fandom there? Yeah, so obviously, like I said before, grew up 40, 40, 45 minutes north of Boston. So um, Patriots has kind of been in my blood. Patriots has been in my blood since the day I was born. Um, Tom Brady has Tom Brady has honestly changed my childhood. Um, but very sad to see him go. Um, but at the end of the day, in Bill Belichick, we trust. So. Yeah, I mean. Before you go, could... one one quick question I have. Um, yes. Growing up, which one, which baseball game have you been to that's been the most memorable? Most memorable. That's a good question. Um, to be honest, it's probably. I mean, I can't really think of anything like where I've actually been in person. I. I didn't really go to many games growing up. I, I went to a bunch of games when I was in college at Northeastern, which is a five minute drive from Fenway, but never really have been in any big, you know, big important games and playoffs or anything. So hopefully to be on the actual field for those games in the future and hitting a bomb over the monster will be one of my, uh, will be one of my things I'm, I'm going to do. So we're looking, we can go to back them. to this video in five <laughs> years when I do that. So remember, well, I us. think we lost Vin. Um, <laughs> I think he. Uh, I think he's just gone. He was calling his name. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I guess we're gonna wrap things up now. Cool. Um, it was awesome talking to you, Max. Yeah, uh, great to talk to you guys too. This is this was fun. Yeah, definitely. Uh, anytime you want to hop back on, be my guest. We do this uh multiple times a week. So anytime sure. you got some free time, we'd love to talk to you again. Cool, man. Uh, you can, and you can meet our good friend Brian DeGennaro. <laughs> Yeah, Brian. Brian's quite a guy. We just roast on him all the time. But um, all right, I love it. Yeah, love hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get to see you play some this season. And uh, have a good night. Stay safe. All right, thanks, brother. You guys thanks too. All right, time. stay safe. All right, have a good. Thanks for your time, man. All right, peace, man.